If you remain in my word, you will be my disciples, and the truth will set you free. Today on the feast of St. John the Baptist, we find another sense of discipleship. John the Baptist was the very first one to recognize who Jesus was, and he did it in utero. If you remember at the visitation, Elizabeth said, the moment your greeting sounded in my ear, the child within my womb leapt for joy. John was the first to recognize Christ, and he spent his life bringing people to Christ, even to the point that he gave his life and was beheaded, rather than deny Christ. Discipleship in our lifetime and in our country has not been so severe. We've grown up in a country where we have freedom of religion. And so discipleship basically meant whether or not you wanted to go to church. And if you wanted to go to church, did you want to follow the beliefs that they talked about and practice them? That was our, our idea of discipleship. And yet, the scriptures are very clear. The, synop the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew and Mark says, our Lord tells his disciples, anyone who wishes to be my disciple must take up his cross and follow me. In Luke's gospel, there's a little twist. When he says, anyone who wishes to be my disciple must take up his cross daily and follow me. And discipleship has never really demanded that out of any of us. But yet, those of you who don't know, if you come over here, we've got this lovely granite altar. But if you pull up the cloth right here, you're going to see a piece of white marble. And in this marble is a relic of a martyr. And every consecrated altar throughout the world has a relic in its altar to remind us that our faith did not come to us freely. The blood of the martyrs is why we still have the faith. Throughout history, people have tried to eradicate Christianity. And yet it was only the blood of the martyrs it kept the faith alive. And we remind ourselves of that every time we say Mass on a consecrated altar. And so we deal with the challenges that we're now faced with. We live in a country where the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion are prohibiting the free practice thereof. They came here because they didn't want to be forced to be the queen's religion. They wanted to know and love and serve God the way they had come to know him and the way they wanted to know him. The framers of our Constitution relied upon St. Thomas Aquinas's natural law. And what St. Thomas Aquinas says is that <clears throat> we are made by God and we are made for God. And within us, there is a longing for God. And there are certain things that are, in, are innate. You take two little babies who are just starting to walk and one of them pushes the other one down and the baby starts crying the baby's going to go over there and try to stop the baby from crying. That's just an aid. We're not made evil. We're made for God. And that's part of who we are. And so in the natural law, St. Thomas Aquinas says that we are drawn to God, so we do good. We shun evil and we serve the common good. 
And Thomas Aquinas goes on to say, because we are gods, God has endowed everyone with life, liberty, and according to Thomas Aquinas, a state, belongings, goods. John Locke, the frame of our Constitution, barred from this when he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and instead of a state, he says, the pursuit of happiness. That's why we were founded. And little by little, that freedom to know and to love and to serve God is now in danger. Especially with this most current mandate, which they call the HHS mandate, the Health and Human Services mandate, which says that every employer must provide for their workers insurance that includes artificial contraception and the RU486 pill, which is commonly known as the morning after pill. It will go in and destroy whatever may be of conceived. So by its definition, it's a board of fascia. That's the, the mandate that we face, thus the reason for this current fortnight of freedom. But we have to understand, this didn't begin yesterday. This is not something that's come up in our country in the last four years. Back in 1965, when Madeleine Murray O'Hare, the famous former Catholic and now confirmed atheist, decided prayer was offensive, we outlawed prayer. That it was offensive. Now we go back to John Locke's, that we're called to um, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and to serve the common good. Well, what is a common good? When an entire stadium with 90,000 people, if a dozen people are offended by prayer, no one gets prayer. The rest of them are denied that. And it's no longer about the common good. The individual right is what is more important than anything else. And we find ourselves in a situation where the tail is wagging the dog. And when we talk about the, th the way we have devolved over the years. Well, first we got rid of prayer, and prayer in school, and prayer public events. Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, at Columbine, when they had about 17 kids killed, they had a huge prayer service in the auditorium to pray for the 17 dead kids. You'd think if maybe they would have prayed every day in that auditorium, Maybe those 17 kids wouldn't be dead. Now the individual right, because there's been tragedy, we don't worry about that. Same thing after 9-11. 9-11, when we thought we were under attack, in the very chambers where they outlawed prayer, in public places, they had a prayer service, praying for the safety of our country. Those same commentators, who are on national network television, asked that God might protect our country and keep us safe. If they would have given that statement a week before 9-11, they would have been fired. But now that we're scared, we call upon God. And then, but we remain silent. And then when Judge Roberts in Alabama was forced to take the Ten Commandments out of his courtroom, and he resigned from the bench. At the time, they were having an increase on season tickets for LSU. You heard a hell of a lot more about the season ticket increase than we did about the removal of the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments aren't a Catholic prayer. They're not a Jewish prayer. They're not a Muslim prayer. They're not a Buddhist prayer. They're universally accepted among people of faith. And when you remove that, it's not taking a piece of stone out of a building. It's saying we no longer look to God 
for what's right and wrong, or what's moral, or what's immoral. Because in a democratic society, one more than half makes something right. And we'll depend upon ourselves to define morality, good and evil. I don't know about you, but I find that a very dangerous, dangerous place to be when mankind and more, one more than half decides what morality is. And now we find ourselves with this HHS mandate. And what it says is that if we, and when the church objected, we were given an end all. We were told that, okay, the Catholic Church, because it violates your conscience, you will not be forced to, uh, to pay for that. But we will make the insurance companies provide it for you free of charge. It's in the money issue. It's a conscience issue. It violates what we believe and what we've come to teach about God. The second thing is, is our insurer is Catholic Mutual of Omaha. We have a Catholic insurance company. And they're not going to do it either. They're not going to follow the mandate. And third thing is, how many of you have ever gotten anything free from your insurance company? <laughs> I just don't lie an item it, but all your premiums go up, right? So, the time to deal with this is now. And it's not a Catholic issue. As you'll see, following Mass in the parish hall, Dr. Reggie Bridges, pastor of First Baptist, is going to speak. We have some others speaking because this is for people of faith. When the government tells us what we can believe and teach and what we cannot believe and teach, let me tell you what happens, what's already happened. In the states of Illinois and Massachusetts, Catholic Charities no longer does adoption services. Catholic Charities in the United States has had hundreds of years of placing hundreds of thousands of children in good, safe homes. But because the federal government now mandates you have to give place as many children in same-sex marriages as you do in heterosexual marriages, we no longer do adoptions. We can't, we can't do it. Currently in Brazil, a seminary rector <coughs> is in jail for a hate crime because a young man approached him, said, I'm gay, I'm active, I'm out, I'm proud, and I want to be a priest. And the rector said, I'm sorry, we don't allow actively gay homosexual candidates to study for the priesthood. So he's in jail for a hate crime. Currently in Ireland and Australia, they are trying to make priests violate the seal of confession that if someone comes to me and either says they're a child molester or someone comes to me and says they've been molested, they're saying I have to leave the confession and call the police and identify who these people are. Well, let me tell you the seal of confession kind of like being pregnant. You can't be just a little pregnant, okay? And once I violate, violate the seal of confession, I really don't think those elected officials want us to tell everything we know. And we can't just limit it to one area. But that's being tried. You realize what that means for, for me as a priest or any priest? People come to me in confidentiality, knowing that I will never tell anybody what that means. You violate that, and the government forces me to violate it, which I would never do. I'd go to jail first, but you realize what that means. Currently in Austria, they, the priests no longer marry people. See, here in the state of Louisiana, as it was in Austria, I'm registered with the state of Louisiana as a marriage official. And when some young couple comes to get married, they bring me a state of Louisiana civil marriage license. And I fill it out, sign everything, and because I married them and signed it, they're considered married in the eyes of the state. Well, if they ever legalize in the state of Louisiana same-sex marriages, which it is in Austria, and I refuse to marry a same-sex couple, 
then I'm discriminating and can be prosecuted for that. That's why in Austria they no longer marry. If you want to get married, you're going to get married by the state, and then they'll come back and marry you sacramentally. That's what we're faced with. Not just we as Catholics. All people of faith are faced with the government telling us what we can practice, what we can believe. And I think it's important that we realize, you know, we like to blame it on Washington and the damn politicians and everything they do. Let me tell you something. This isn't a dictatorship. This is a democracy. These people got there one vote at a time. Our votes. We're the ones who put the people in the power to make these decisions that are affecting us. Nobody else did that. We did it. You can blame everyone else you want, but we need to first condemn ourselves for our own silence. We had a rally on the state capitol steps two weeks ago, and granted it wasn't that well publicized, we had about 200 people from Baton Rouge. Now if someone would have said less miles and the, the football team was out there, you know, you'd have been halfway to the old governor's mansion. It's our own silence. It's our own allowing other things to become more important. Following Mass, everyone's invited to join us for lunch and join us to listen to uh, Billy, uh, Mayor Billy DeQuilla of St. Francisville, one of our uh, parishioners, uh, Chris Flanders, uh, Dr. Reggie Bridges will be there for us to realize it's, it's all of our fight. You know, we worry about the, the environment and the ecology and we want everything to be green so we can give to our children this wonderful universe for years to come. With the absence of God and the absence of religion and polluted hearts and distorted minds, we're doing our children no favor. If we fall down on this, God help our children. You better pray for them. Because we're not standing up to protect what they need so desperately. Time is now, and the person is you. It's not anybody else. It's not any other group, it's us. If we remain silent, we deserve what we get.